<sighs> Mark chapter 8. I'm reading from verse 22 to 25. Mark 8, 22 to 25. And while you are doing that, uh, I forgot, you, you need to give a real big round of applause to the choir. Uh, even if I'm the one saying so, it is still true. You are fantastic. Uh, you are a fantastic choir. Very, very good choir. Let's give the Lord another big round of applause for them. <laughs> Mark chapter 8 from verse 22 to 25. And, and he came to Bethsaida, and they bring a blind man unto him, and besought him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand, and led him out of the, the town. And when he had spit on his eyes, and put his hands upon him, he asked him if he saw aught. And he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. After that, he put his hands again upon his eyes and made him look up. And he was restored and saw every man clearly. I want to talk to you for a few minutes because I have a plane to catch on the second touch. Somebody is going to get a second touch today. <laughs> they brought a man to the Lord Jesus Christ. He was blind. And Jesus took him by the hand. I wish I have a long time, I would have shown you the implications of all this thing one by one. Jesus took him by the hand. Oh, how I pray that today Jesus will just come to you and take you by the hand. <laughs> and then he led him aside, away from the crowd. You see, there are some miracles you get that are for you alone. Uh, when God wants to do something extraordinary for you, it takes you aside. When you read 2 Kings chapter 4, from verse 1 to 7, 2 Kings 4, 1 to 7, a man of God told the widow of Zarephath, he said, the miracle you're about, you're about to get is for you and you alone. Shut the door. Keep outsiders away. There are some miracles you don't want neighbor to see until it is completed. Mm. Because they could interfere. And there are some miracles that are just for you and you alone. That special miracle that God will say, hey, my son, my daughter, this is for you and you alone. Receive it this morning. He took him aside. And he did something very unusual. He spit on his eyes. <laughs> uh, I'm blind. And you are spitting on my eyes. Well, what do you mean? When God wants to perform a miracle, don't limit him. Don't tell him the method he should use. <laughs> you remember the story of Naaman very well. Neymar, you are the leper. You came to a man of God to help you. A man of God said, you should go and wash. 
for seven times in River Jordan. And he got angry. He said, ah, what's wrong with him? There are cleaner rivers in my nation. Why don't I wash in them and be clean? Hey, go. He said, I thought he would come out, strike his hand on the leprosy, and then call on his God. You, you, you are teaching God how to do things. <laughs> Is there anybody here today who will say, whatever method you want to use, God, just give me my miracle. <laughs> After he spat on his eyes, he then touched him. Gave him the first touch. Just one touch is enough to solve any problem. One touch from the Most High God can take care of every problem. One of these days, if God will allow us to come back, we'll talk about uh, how a single touch is enough. Because when you take somebody like the leper in Matthew chapter 8, from verse 1 to 3, Matthew 8, 1 to 3, he was a leper. And because he was a leper, <laughs> he's automatically a poor man. Because he was a leper, he was banished from the gathering of multitudes, etc., etc. But just one touch changed everything. Uh, I pray for someone here today. The Almighty God will touch you. And then, then he said to him, uh, now I've touched you. Uh, can you see anything? Oh, he said, I can see men walking like trees. That tells you this man had been able to see before. He, could, he, he, he knew trees. And he could he know when men are around. But then something went wrong. And now he couldn't differentiate between trees of oh mine until that touch came. But the section I want to discuss for the little time I have is that Jesus gave him a second touch. I believe very, very firmly that all of us who came here on Friday, we got a touch from God. I know that I know that I know that God did something last Friday that some of us for the next year or two we will still be reaping the fruits. But then occasionally God needs to touch you a second time. That's the purpose of this meeting. God wants to perfect whatever he had done in your life. Yeah. And in my life too. <laughs> ah, glory be to God. Somebody is going to get a second touch this morning. Now, when we talk about a second touch, I will just give you two or three examples. And then we will pray. Uh, the first touch is good, but the second touch is better. Let's take the example of Israel. In Exodus chapter 12, from verse 30 to 36, Exodus 12, 30 to 36, when Israel got the first touch, their problem of, of 430 years came to an end immediately. When they got that first touch, the Pharaoh who had been holding them captive, who had said, who is God? I, I don't know him and I won't let Israel go, came begging 
Say, please go. Go quickly and bless me also. Single touch. And your number one enemy will come begging. Yeah. One single touch. And all the salaries they have owed the generations of Israel for more than 430 years, they paid in one day. They were so anxious for them to leave. Whatever they asked for, they gave them. I have good news for someone. Whatever the devil has stolen from you must be restored. But then by the time you go out to Exodus chapter 14, what do we see? Suddenly, the enemies gather themselves together and say, let's pursue them. we we'll catch, we we'll catch up with them and bring them back into bondage. We will bring them back, take all the money they have taken from us, take everything, reduce them to square one. Then God gave them a second touch. The Red Sea opened. The children of Israel passed through on dry ground. The enemy followed. The sea closed on them. And something happened that Moses prophesied. He said, the enemies we have seen before, you will never see them again. <laughs> A second touch seals your victory. The second touch means if you have been sick and you were healed on Friday, you will never be sick again. <laughs> My children have asked me, if you are never sick again, how are you going to die? You don't have to be sick to die. And may I decree to somebody here today, for the rest of your life, you will know no sickness. Yeah. A second touch will make sure that everything you have taken back from Satan, Satan will not be able to steal it again. Yeah. A second touch can do a lot of things. I'll give you another example. Take Daniel chapter 3. You can read the whole story. The true Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the fairy furnace. And God gave them a touch. How? Because the Son of God himself was there in the fire waiting for them. So they made contact with him and suddenly the fire that was supposed to kill them became like an air-conditioned room. The ropes binding them was completely destroyed. The people who threw them in were killed just in one touch. A single touch can put an end to your yokes. A single touch can humiliate your enemy. Uh, even Pharaoh, um, Nebuchadnezzar, got up and said, uh -uh. I thought we threw three men in, now I can see four. Hey, should have me shine a bit? Come out. And they came out of the ferry for me. That was the first touch. And that was beautiful. But if you read the story to the end, you will see that they got a second touch. Because the king now said, I promote you. <laughs> they were ordinary slaves when they threw them in. Now, with the second touch, you can read the study your Bible very well. With the second touch, nobody ever bothered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego again. I have good news for somebody here today. 
the witches and wizards, the forces of darkness in every part of your life. Not only have they been silenced on Friday, today I decree to you they will never come near you again. I can give you several other examples, but uh, maybe I will take David and Goliath. When you read the story of David and Goliath, and you can read it in 1 Samuel chapter 17, you can begin the story, you can even read the old chapter, a beautiful reading. But you find something interesting there if you pay attention to the story. The Bible said David slew Goliath with that rock. Just took one rock, sent it flying, hit Goliath on the forehead, and Goliath fell down. The Bible said he killed Goliath. That's first touch. But the story didn't end there. The Bible said there was no sword in the hand of Goliath. And so he went, took the sword of the enemy, and cut off his head. That was the second touch. You see, because God was saying, yes, Goliath is down. But if we don't take off his head, what if he resurrects? What if he revives? Not only will the Goliath in your life fall down and die, because of the second touch that we are going to get this morning, his head will be cut off. In, at least in Nigeria, there is a proverb. Stay away from a snake whose head has not been cut off. <laughs> The elders will say, wait till the head of the snake is cut off before you can begin to really, really rejoice. And every snake in your home, every snake in your place of work, every snake in your church, their head will be cut off this morning. The second church perfects your miracle. The Bible says in Psalm 138, verse 8, Psalm 138, verse 8, it said, God will perfect that which concerns me. God will make everything perfect for me. The meaning of the word perfect is that without anything left that is not 100% good. It is good to be healed. But if you have no money to feed, hunger will kill you. Perfection means not only will God heal you, He will provide you with enough money to enjoy the rest of your life. In the story of the woman that I referred to earlier on 2 Kings chapter 4, from verse 1 to 7, not only was her debt paid, read it very well, she had enough money to live on for the rest of her life. I decree that if anybody here is owing, in a way you can't explain, God will pay the debt. And then God will now bring you to a level where you will never borrow again. I tell you a story. Because I believe God is talking to someone in particular. We were having a program like this, and I was this my daughter. I was in very, very serious trouble. The husband died and left, left her with a huge amount of debt. And about 17 people to look after. 
And suddenly God spoke to me and said, there's someone here. I'm going to give you a breakthrough. And you have to bring the breakthrough to me. And God said, after that, I will take care of your situation. But a week later, the woman came, the, my daughter came, and brought a, a huge amount of money, at least, by our standard in those days. I said, this is what God did. This is what God did. I said, yes, so what? And God said, he will give me one breakthrough, then I should bring that to him, and then he will bring my own. Ah. <laughs> because I, I know the situation very well. I said, Mama, God said, someone here. <laughs> I, I'm not quite sure it's you he's talking about. You. I can't take this kind of, I know the kind of problems you have. In fact, anyway, big as that money is, <laughs> he can't, it's just a drop in the back bucket. Can't take care of the problem. So I said, I can't take this money. Ah. He said, so you want to block the way of the second miracle? I said, no. So I took the money. Well, I'm telling you the truth. We didn't touch the money at all. I just kept it in one corner. Then God moved. God is going to move for you today. <laughs> and she got a letter from London because the, the huge debt she, she had had to do with uh, some money that the husband uh, borrowed in the UK. We have discovered that we made a mistake. Your husband is not owing us. We are the one owing him. I mean, it doesn't make sense. They don't make that kind of mistake <laughs> in London. So come and see us so that we can give you what uh, we owe your husband. That wiped out the debt, number one. Now she became so worthy. Eh? She became a member of the board of the bank she was owing. I decree to somebody here today, Whatever you are owing, God will pay. And he will bless you so you will never borrow again. When we talk about making perfect that which concerns you, a very classical examination will be Daniel chapter 6. You know the story. Daniel was already was being rapidly promoted, rapidly promoted, until he became one of the three in the kingdom. And because he had this excellent spirit in him, he was going to be made number one. Then the enemies ganged up against him. And they got the king to sign a decree that anybody who prays should be thrown into the den of lions. They knew that Daniel would pray. You can do whatever you like. So anyway, they got Daniel into the den of lions, and Daniel got the first touch. The Almighty God came, shut the mouth of lions, and the following morning, lion was brought out alive. That was a great, great miracle. And every one of you that might be in any form of den of lions, you will come out. Yeah. And the perfection of the story was that the king now said, all those who have been troubling Daniel, come. And don't come alone. Come with your wife. Come with your children. And when they arrived, the king said to them, do you recognize this man? Oh, yes. Ah, this is Daniel. Hey, what happened to Daniel yesterday? Well, we got him thrown into the den of lions. Ah, have you ever seen a man 
spend the night in the den of lions and come out alive? They said, no. Something must have happened to my lions. So I want you and your family to go down there, find out for me what happened to my lions. You know the rest of the story. Before they got to the bottom of the den, the lions finished the story. Only God knows when next I will be in South Africa. I have been praying. If he says come back tomorrow, I will come back. But I want to use this last service just in case we don't meet on this side of eternity again. I want to use this last service to say to you, to decree in the name that's above every other name, that anybody who tries to throw you into the den of lions will replace you there. I want to use this opportunity to decree that everything in your life that needs to be perfected will be perfected this morning. I want to use this opportunity to decree that whatever is not allowing your joy to be full, the Almighty God will wipe it out this morning. I want to use this opportunity to decree that my Father in heaven will give you a miracle so big that your joy will overflow. So shall it be in Jesus. Please be seated. When we talk about God making everything perfect, the last example I will give you will be that of Lazarus. Lazarus died. He, discomp he decomposed. By the time the Lord came, the sister said, he's now stinking. Case beyond help. But the Lord reversed the irreversible which he will do for you. Amen. And call Lazarus out of the tomb. And God knows my heart that everything that had died, every glory that is supposed to be already lost forever in your life, in the whole of South Africa. The God who can reverse the irreversible, we reverse the irreversible. But Jesus didn't just bring Lazarus out of the tomb. He commanded, loose him and let him go. That was the second thought that a touch of perfection. I've come here this morning to decree in the name that's above every other name that from now on you will go for Jesus. <laughs> that everything that has not allowed you to serve God the way you should serve him the Almighty God we consume this morning. Yeah. It shall be well with you. Yeah. So, conclusion. Please be seated. We're finished. The conclusion is simple. They brought this man to Jesus. Jesus took him by the hand. He could have said to Jesus, leave my hand. Who are you? He couldn't see. Who is that fellow holding my hand? Jesus led him out of the crowd. He could have said, where are you taking me? Leave me alone. 
Jesus spat on his eyes. He could begin a fight there. He said, I, I can't see you, but at least I can, I can swing a blow or two. That man, without even waiting for his miracle, surrendered completely. He never struggled with the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm begging you from now on, don't struggle with the one who can give you a second touch. There are many of us Christians who have become so sophisticated that we now struggle. We even struggle to serve Jesus Christ. Oh my God. Whenever I look back and I see those of us who got born again at the same time, and I see those people who were on fire for God then, but have cooled down mightily now, I have been able to trace it to one point. At a stage in their Christian life, they began to struggle with the Lord of Lords. At a stage in their life, those of us who, when we got born again, when we were young Christians, we danced for Jesus Christ. We couldn't care who was looking. We shouted, our shouts were the loudest. We served God with everything we had. We didn't have much, but with the little we had, we served Him. But as we began to grow, things changed. Uh, what's going on? Praise and worship. Oh, that's for children. That's for newcomers. Shout hallelujah, hallelujah. I've been shouting all this year now. By now, uh, God should know I've tried. And, and then God began to prosper us. And the things we were able to do when we had nothing became difficult for us to do when we have something. You know what I'm talking about. You want him to perfect that which concerns you. Change your attitude towards him. Let your attitude be the attitude of the man who was blind. And somebody who couldn't see took his hand. Can you see tomorrow? My brothers and sisters. Someone you could not see took your hand. How many of us, I mean, how many of us have seen Jesus face to face? But he said, let me take your hand. Let me lead you out of the crowd. Let me make you special. Let your, let your own miracle be for you and for you alone. Think again. How hot was I at the beginning of my Christian life? How hot am I now? And change your attitude. When, he, when we talk about making him Lord of our lives, you know people talk about it. They say, there's this statement. If you will not allow him to be Lord of all, then he will not be Lord at all. Please, change your attitude. When it comes to anything that has to do with the Lord, go all out. He doesn't like people who are lukewarm. He prefers those who hate him. He knows that uh, these are potential Candidates, you will come and deal with them on their own time. And he loves those who will serve him violently with everything in they have. You know, we used to say in those days, 
A Christian fanatic is someone who loves Jesus more than you. Please, my brothers and sisters, just in case Jesus comes before we meet again, remember this morning and your life will become perfect. Yeah. And then there are some of us who have not, not, never even surrendered to Jesus Christ. Why don't you do so this morning? It's a very, very special Sunday, you know. There was no need for me to wait till today. I have already finished my main assignment on Friday night. I could have traveled yesterday. But God wanted me to wait till this morning so that somebody who is not yet saved can surrender his or her life to Jesus so that God can make perfect the life of someone. I'm not only calling forward those who want to surrender their life to Jesus for the first time. I'm also calling on backsliders, those who used to serve God, those who said they would never touch sin again, but they have gone back into sin. Come back to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let him restore you into fellowship with him. I'm going to count from one to seven because I'm running out of time. So if you want to come, you come very quickly and surrender your life to him, 100%. You want to be restored to him, come very quickly as I'm counting now. One, let us pray now. My Father, and my God, I want to thank you. I want to thank you once again for arranging this meeting. I know how strongly the enemy fought so that this meeting may not hold. And I thank you for giving us victory at last. Please accept our thanks in Jesus' name. I'm committing this, your children, to your hands. If they are sick, heal them perfectly today. If they are poor, my Father, my God, begin to prosper them perfectly today. If they are in any form of bondage, you, the Lord of hosts, every evil force that is hindering the progress of this, your children, let your fire consume. <laughs> if there's any one of them trusting you for the fruit of the womb, even if they're asking you for one child, give them double. <laughs> If there's any one of them expecting promotion, because they came this morning, Father, give them double promotion. <laughs> Whatever miracle this your children may need, Daddy, I pray, that even if they knock at one door, open seven unto them. <laughs> Grant their request. Perfect that we concerns them. Lord God Almighty, before this month end, let their joy overflow. <laughs> and then the grace to begin to serve you like never before. <laughs> Grant that grace to them, Lord. <laughs> Uphold them to the end. <laughs> and even if we don't meet here again on earth, I pray that in your kingdom, none of us will be missing. Daddy, I'm committing them into your hands now. They will be crying unto you for perfection of miracles. Please, whatever they ask for, before the sun sets today, turn it to a testimony. Thank you, Almighty God. For in Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Now go ahead and cry to the Almighty God. Tell him what, what, in what area you want him to perfect your life. Go ahead, talk to him. Talk to the Almighty God. Let him hear you. Tell him what you want him to do to make your joy perfectly full. 